So thank you everyone for um, for having me today at, uh, uh, at this uh, AGM and presentation afterwards. Um, my name is Alex Buckman. I am a senior manager within energy systems modeling at Energy Systems Catapult. Um, do, do, by the way, do shout up if my speakers go fuzzy because sometimes my aux cable has a tendency to do that. Um, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm kind of, so my role within Energy Systems Catapult is that I, I work within um, a team of around about 25 modelers that work across different scales of modeling. Um, everything from building a simulation through to local area energy planning and the modeling that sits behind that and right up to the national scale, scale stuff. And so I've been kindly invited here by John Parsons um, on the back of some of the work that we've been doing with, uh, with BEMA um, recently. And so today, what I want to talk to you about is, is some of the kind of latest modeling that we've done on the impact of carbon budget six, um, but also going into a bit more depth on some of the work we've done with BEMA around the electricity supply chain and the kind of the market opportunity for that. So um, I think in terms of how kind of we, we kind of play this, I'm, there's not too many of us here. So um, if you want to leave comments in the, in the chat, then I can pick them up at the end and respond to them. But also if you just want to kind of shout out with any questions, please, please do so. I've got, I've got a few screens around me, so I, can, I think I can see when hands are up. So if, uh, if you want to put your hand up and ask a question, please, please do so. I'll try and keep an eye on that. Um, but before I kick off with the kind of the detailed stuff, I just wanted to give you a bit of information about the, um, about the energy systems catapult. Um, so we, uh, we are one of nine uh, catapults that have been set up um, quite a few years ago now. Um, and so we are um, independent from each other, although we're part of, a, um, kind of a, the same kind of family of catapults. Uh, set up in different areas. So you have everything from gene therapy and high value manufacturing, which many of you might um, be familiar with, all the way through to uh, us and the offshore renewable energies catapult um, and the connected places catapult, for example. And so we have a, within the catapults, we tend to have kind of things that we, um, uh, assets that we help people with, either might have big warehouses full of stuff, stuff where we do trials, or in our case, we have kind of things like a living lab or a load of really powerful models. And we tend to try and collaborate with various organizations from public, private um, and academia to, um, to deliver projects. So kind of that, that's kind of the uh, uh, what a group of catapults do. But in terms of us in, in particular, we the energy, energy systems catapult um, is around about 230 people strong at the moment. Um, we were set up to um, our mission is to unleash innovation and open new markets and capture the clean growth opportunity. Um, so, but, but how we do that, we, we, we do it through various ways. So we support, we kind of do it from two directions, really. One, we support innovators to commercialize. So kind of for, for in, innovative companies that have products that they want to bring to market, we try and help them through that journey. Um, but at the same time, we kind of work with organizations that want kind of, kind of a systems level view and um, to, to kind of design future energy systems. So we work with whether it be government or whether it be off-gem or, or devolved governments or, or kind of large companies that have an interest in that kind of thing. So you have that kind of two-pronged approach and then and we try and meet those two in the middle. Um, the, on the right-hand side there of that, uh, uh, of, of that slide there, you can see a lot of the kind of different things that we do. Um, so kind of in terms of the stuff that I've, um, I've been working on mostly, um, We've, I've been doing some of the, a lot of the whole system modeling side of things, also the uh, infrastructure and engineering, the in integration of transport and energy systems um, and decarbonizing local places. And so we, we have various things um, within the catapult that we, uh, uh, that we do. And I'm, I'm happy to give more information about it later. But it, in, general, in general, the theme for this catapult um, is whole systems thinking. Now, I'm very conscious that everyone on this call is probably familiar with the concept, but we all might have slightly different definitions of what whole systems mean. So, and I think for the purpose of this presentation, it's kind of, it's fairly useful for me to go through what we mean by whole systems thinking. So we try and join up the system from the sources of energy all the way to the consumer. And importantly, when we talk about whole systems here, we're talking about kind of multiple vectors. So everything, electricity, district heating, hydrogen, gas, um, kind of CO2, uh, all, all these kind of different vectors and across different sectors, so electricity, heat and transport. And we also try within the catapult as a whole, we try to link up physical system with markets, policy um, and the digital system 
as well as kind of um, then all linking that back to the consumer. So that underpins a lot of the work we do. And so hopefully when I talk through some of the modeling that we've been doing, you'll see that some of that kind of is clear in how we try and represent the energy system. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'll, I'll crack on with the um, with some of the uh, some of the stuff now. I, I admit that I have um, had a little, a little bit of a, uh, a Google or some of some of you guys, so I'm I'm pretty sure that um, there's a lot of people here that uh, normally I'll just jump straight into the outputs, but I think there's quite a lot of people here that might be interested in the, in the actual model, uh, the actual model that we use. So I'm going to do one one slide on um, on our model, which is called ESME. Uh, ESME stands for Energy Systems Modeling Environment, and this ESME is set up um, around about. Uh, 14 years ago back at the Energy Technologies Institute um, and since then it's had um, uh, well, probably hundreds of millions of pounds worth of uh, investment into either the data that goes into it or the model itself um, uh, thanks to thanks to in, largely in part the Energy Technologies Institute um, and in terms of what kind of model it is so it's, it's a whole system kind of across these power heat transport industry and energy infrastructure and it's least cost techno-economic optimization and so that kind of fundamentally, that means that we're, um, we're just taking into account the technology performance and the cost of that performance and, and, and trying to define as well as we can the end user demands that these things are trying to, uh, trying to meet. So we're policy neutral, we're technology agnostic, we're not representing markets. Um, often we uh, talk about uh, ESME as almost being reflecting what happens if markets were perfect and what happens if, if they're actually reflective um, of kind of physics as opposed to kind of what's realistically achievable within market uh, markets. So that's kind of what we're trying to represent within within ESME. What's the least cost energy system design? So it's, it's, it's data driven, as, as with many many models, um, and it's a uh, and it, we've got kind of hundreds of technologies in there. Um, it, there are there are parts of ESME that we that we can use when when we feel when we feel like it's necessary. Um, things like the probabilistic tre treatment of key uncertainties, recognizing that um, there's a kind of there isn't an answer. There, there's just a range of kind of range of solutions and risks and uncertainties associated with, with each one. Um, with what I'm talking to talk to you about today, we've done some of that in the background, but I'm not going to be talking about the probabilistic side of it too much. Um, and then and then we kind of it's also out to 2050. And it's kind of we we can look at five year time steps, um, but we kind of change that depending on what the needs of the of the particular thing we're doing uh, are. Um, and finally, the spatial and temporal resolution side of things. So we have um, uh, twelve onshore regions and eleven offshore regions uh, within ESME, um, and uh, and from the temporal resolution, we kind of our chunks tend to be um, kind of four six hour time periods. Um, but we also rep and representative days, but we also represent kind of anti-cyclone um, uh, kind of peak periods and also typical kind of peak periods in a particular year um, to kind of to try and uh, try and capture kind of the majority of the um, demands that the kind of energy system will uh, be required to meet over the course of the year. Albeit there are we have other models that look into things in a little bit more detail than ESME does. Um, right, so. What I wanted to kind of talk to you about is um, some of our um, modeling that we've been doing with ESME. So we've, um, in, in 2020, uh, ESC published some um, scenarios called in, in, within a publication called the Innovate Internet Zero Scenarios. Um, now these are, uh, were based upon um, prior to carbon budget six, um, and they were the first net zero scenarios that we had, um, that we had done. And it was it was seen that these were quite challenging scenarios to meet at the time. Um, there are two there are two scenarios that we looked at. One was called clockwork, uh, which is characterised by a, a centrally planned energy system and prioritising technology as a means to deliver net zero. So we had things like large scale nuclear, um, and we had quite a lot of uh, CCS, and we were optimistic about our domestically grown biomass, things like that. Um, and it is other than kind of some shifts of kind of transport from kind of combustion engines to kind of electric vehicles, that largely people's way of life was relatively, the changes to people's ways of life was relatively modest. So in, in contrast, there is another scenario called patchwork, which is much more where the population engages with the climate crisis. So this is where um, the preference uh, was renewable power generation instead of nuclear, and kind of we had nature-based greenhouse uh, removals through afforestation, um, 
uh, and people adopted habits and lifestyle choices that helped us meet that net zero target. So since then, the CCC um, kind of released they released the sixth carbon budget, and so we, as you, as you know, we've we've got to um, uh, reduce our current greenhouse emissions by seventy eight percent by twenty thirty five. And so, in addition to that, within the modelling that I'm about to present to you, we had a few more um, changes that we made. Um, so one was a constraint to reflect the twenty thirty ban on new petrol and diesel cars and vans, uh, updates to cost of nuclear generation based upon our uh, a project we did called Cost Drivers, um, nuclear, uh, nuclear Cost Drivers Project. Um, uh, we, we introduced uh, advanced nuclear reactors capable of producing hydrogen and electricity. And also we reduced the operating and maintenance costs of offshore wind with, with, in line with uh, the latest understanding. But what you can see, the main, the main thing on this chart on this, on this particular page is showing is that we already had quite a tough challenge to meet net zero. And this sixth carbon budget is put quite it's, it's fairly profound um, impact on what we need to do in the near term in, in order to meet um, the carbon budget. So this is a significant challenge to us with that solid line representing um, the new scenario and the dotted line representing the old scenario. So now I'm going to, within this presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on power, so there'll be, there'll be, we'll talk about other sectors a, a little bit, but I'm most, mostly going to focus on power, um, the power sector, because that's what um, uh, the Beamer work largely re reflects. Um, but in terms of the sixth carbon budget, it promotes a deep decarbonisation in the UK power sector in the 2020s and 2030s. Um, so we have a situation where unabated gas consumption and waste gasification is replaced with higher capacities of low carbon generation. Um, offshore wind and nuclear power um, from the mid and the late 2020s. So you, you can see that within um, this, the, the scenario that we're present, I'm presenting to you here is the clockwork um, uh, carbon budget six uh, power system, which, are, which is it ends up being our kind of default one. And things like BEX um, uh, with uh, kind of uh, BEXs are actually absolutely crucial to meeting our um, carbon targets in this one. We also, so we have um, relatively high levels of nuclear. So actually, traditionally, the catapult has been seen as quite a, um, an organization that has quite optimistic levels of nuclear deployment. Um, I think in, in reflection of the latest energy security strategy, I think we're one of the only organizations that actually predicts somewhere in the region of, of um, 24 gigawatts is, it could, could, be a, could be kind of deployable um, within, a, uh, within the UK energy system. So, um, so it's a, it, 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 yeah, it's it, again, trying to emphasize the challenge and trying to emphasize the different types of um, uh, methods through which we actually end up trying to meet these decarbonization targets. So if, if we looked at, for example, space heating. So the chart on the left shows the emissions from space heating between our <clears throat> previous scenarios and the CB6 compliant scenarios. So. I'm not sure for any of you, I'm not sure how um, uh, how engaged everyone is in all the building decarbonisation stuff that um, uh, that's going on, but generally we're not being very successful at actually implementing building decarbonisation um, kind of uh, strategies. We've got some good ideas, but they're not being great at implementing. Now, we've, now we, if we're going to meet our, um, uh, our decarbonisation targets now, we've got to act much more quickly in order to do that. Um, and so uh, both scenarios, the clockwork and the patchwork, so the clockworks uh, in the middle and the patchworks on the right, um, see accelerated decarbonisation from the mid 2020s uh, relative to our previous scenarios. Um, uh, 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 which, and they, they saw, and previous scenarios saw modest decarbonisation of the sector to about 2040, followed by a rapid sprint, as you can see on, on those dashed lines on the left. Um, but for the for, for carbon budget six, the entire building stock, for all intents and purposes, kind of gets to kind of net zero by twenty forty five. Um, and so, by taking a look at how the heat is supplied, it's possible to understand how the heating sector decarbonizes decarbon decarbonization differs um, in the two scenarios. Um, so, by twenty thirty, uh, both scenarios see around twenty percent drop in the amount of space heat provided by gas heating. Uh, from this point on, the speed of the transition from gas in the two scenarios um, 
uh, co-op work transitions away from gas at a faster pace than patchwork. So the other so a couple of other aspects you kind of kind of recognize is that um, within clockwork, um, the high biomass availability um, uh, has a quite, a quite significant effect, as well as the large amount of small modular reactors. And now within, within the small modular reactors, what we see um, uh, is the opportunity for these to actually be providing space heating as well um, uh, by linking up with district heat networks. So this is based upon a fairly substantial project we did um, with, uh, um, back, back at the ETI where we, we identified um, kind of all of these sites that are kind of suitable for uh, nuclear power stations, both building on the existing power stations, uh, but also identifying all of, the, all of the sites that can have the correct kind of um, uh, kind of uh, suitability for kind of new small modular reactors, including how big a um, demand there is for uh, for district heating within proximity of within reasonable proximity of those of those nuclear reactors. And so when we when we kind of plug those uh, into our modelling, we tend to find quite a um, quite a uh, big uptake of district heating, which is being fed by uh, small modular reactors. And so, and this this is kind of emphasised here. So, within um, uh, within the charts on the right, on the on the, on the top ones is the number of district heating connections. So, um, with the carbon budget six on in the kind of the green and yellow, and the uh, previous scenarios with which weren't carbon budget six compliant in the in the kind of the dark blue black. Um, and so you can see that number of heat networks by nature of the kind of um, preference towards um, small modular reactors in order to meet. Um, the demands of carbon budget six kind of leads to a preference towards um, higher levels of district heat networks. Um, so I am I haven't mentioned much about hydrogen, but rest assured for any of you that you that are that are keen on hydrogen, uh, such as people that know intelligent energy, um, uh, the role of hydrogen across various sectors um, uh, is is kind of plays a pretty significant part throughout this. Um, so we do have hydrogen being used in space heating. Uh, we have it being used in industry, we have it being used in um, heavy duty transport. Um, and, it, and it plays, uh, having done separate studies that where we're looking at kind of what happens without hydrogen, it becomes a lot harder to meet our carbon targets without hydrogen playing a significant role in some part. Um, and then kind of alongside the, uh, I mentioned before that we also introduced these carbon, these, um, uh, these bands on combustion engine vehicles earlier than, uh, than previously were, were done so. And you can see that that's driving um, quite a bit of the kind of emissions reduction um, due to transport in that graph on the bottom, on the bottom line. So um, now, so th that's kind of the overview of the carbon budget six work we've done. There's, kind of, there's plenty more that I could go through, but I thought those were some of the relevant parts that you could kind of see some of the knock-on effects onto the power sector. Um, so what I wanted to go through next is uh, focusing now on the work that we did for Beamer. So kind of the, re the reason that I thought it was useful to go through some of that carbon budget six um, uh, work was because uh, the Beamer uh, work was underpinned by the clockwork carbon budget six scenario. So Beamer, when, when, when we uh, were approached by Beamer, they wanted to understand the implications of carbon budget six for the electricity system supply chain. Um, and I think it's quite a it's quite a, is, is a is a bit kind of very rational way of kind of thinking is kind of seeing the stress that carbon project six puts on the system and then thinking about all of the without skipping to the end, thinking about all the challenges that are faced by this by the supply chain already, and just trying to understand what the implications of this new carbon project six would have. And um, so we the way that we kind of we worked with Beamer, we we uh, we developed some modeling um which both used our ESME carbon budget six scenario, um, but also combined it with some more detailed um, modeling, more kind of spatially granular modeling of energy even infrastructure, um, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit. But we also su surveyed and interviewed a cross section of the Beamer membership. And so we, um, this was a, kind of a mixture of kind of, yeah, one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews, quite detailed structured interviews, and, and a broader survey that went out to the membership. Um, and we uh, and we are aiming to demonstrate the challenges and, and the opportunities um, that CB6 uh, represents. And this, this report is available for you to 
um, find online if you if you if you feel like doing so. So there was some. I'm going to um, just initially uh, talk about some of the um, uh, details of this of the kind of the scenario use within the uh, within the Beamer work. Um, so the, there's three energy vectors that were kind of that, that were key. So as we talked about before, electricity, hydrogen, and industrial heating. Um, but in terms of uh, which technologies can supply these energy vectors, um, within the scenario, there's this fairly balanced mixture of technologies. So including uh, wind and solar energy, nuclear power, carbon capture and storage, uh, methane reformation, and electrolysis. There's, a, there's quite a balance across all three. So it's not, a, it's not extreme. Uh, it's not an extreme scenario. It's what we see as quite, being quite a reasonable one. Um, so we have electri electrification of both transport and heating. Um, and so this this starts to kind of demonstrate kind of the impacts of, on the uh, uh, on the power system, and the transition to uh, the one hundred percent electric um, private transport fleet emerges. And, and so and alongside that, um, you need to have around about twenty eight million vehicle charges to be installed within homes, um, public streets, and, and and workplaces. And so smart charging is the key to delivering uh, to the deliverability of this. And with aggregate peak demands managed to less than around about 0.5 kilowatts at properties that have electric vehicles. So we are, uh, there's a theme running through this that um, we, there are things that we can do to um, mitigate impacts on the power sector, um, but we do represent within this modeling some, um, um, some kind of uh, attempts at managing peak demands already. So um, we also have, um, uh, electrification of road freight uh, is also prioritised, and generally um, flexible heat pump and hybrid heat pump uh, hybrid heat pump systems are used. Coupled with thermal thermal storage, um, provide and they provide much of the space heat supply for homes and businesses in the long term. And so these technologies can, technologies can be deployed at rates in excess of one million units per year by the twenty thirties, um, in order to ensure compliance with the carbon budget, which is which is a, a pretty scary number to think about. Um, and for these rates to be realised, consumers need to consider the technologies to be appealing enough to choose over fossil fuel boilers. And so these are all the challenges that we, we're having to face in order to actually deliver some of the kind of end user components, and never mind these kind of the rest of the supply chain to actually make those components work. Um, and, uh, and so then there are some early signs of acceleration in the deployment of low carbon heating systems. So for example, um, you might already know that with the kind of micro generation certification scheme, um, uh, indicating over 20,000 heat pump installations in the in 10 months to October 2021, which is 120% growth on 2019. So that's good signs, but when you think about that million figure, that's quite low, especially if you're looking at the kind of the S curve, we're looking at yeah, multiple millions needing to be deployed quite soon. Um, and uh, and then, then just to add further salt into the wound, in addition, the installer base, uh, which is estimated to be running at less than 2,000 trained installers at present, um, might need to increase by at least tenfold to deliver the projected deployment rates that we're kind of that we're predicting. And so, the, so that's kind of another part of it. So we've got the, the end technologies, we've got the installers, and then if we go to the next slide, we start looking at the networks. And so, this is where some there's some scary numbers. I'm going to I'm going to be honest with you. Um, there's um, there's some pretty kind of hefty lumps of money, and there's some pretty hefty lumps of network. Um, so I would just before I go into the detail of this, I want to kind of to, just to talk you brief, to briefly how we how we did this. So Esme, as I explained at the beginning, has regional representations of um, of energy system design. So in in Wales, there's capacities of um, um, X hydrogen boilers, X heat pumps. And things like that. Um, what we do then is uh, we then chop those uh, ESME outputs up into um, uh, into smaller spatial scales, and we do this by using local data. So we understand things like uh, the density of buildings, the um, thermal efficiency of buildings, the uh, kind of connections of the gas network, and and things like that to influence where's the most suitable place within that region to put the capacity of stuff that ESME is defining as it kind of forms a least cost system. Um, and so once you have that capacity of kind of that energy system, kind of those energy system characteristics, and we do this by focusing on kind of the peak demand from ESME, 
um, then we start to define typical um, infrastructure um, networks that are required to meet that um, meet that end system design. And so then you compare what you need versus what you've got um, using kind of what, what are our underlying data on kind of all the energy networks um, that we have in uh, the country at the moment. And you look at the deficit. And you look at the uh, look at the delta, um, and then that influence then that influences what stuff you need. So it could be I know um, hundred kilo kilo kilometers of um, X capacity of cable um, uh, at, um, uh, at at X voltage, and uh, then we put that through uh, what we have a cost database of kind of various costs of kind of energy system components per kilometer or per unit. And it's essentially a glorified calculator that takes into account things like um, kind of changing commodity prices and um, and regional variations in installer co installation costs, plant material, labor, that kind of thing, um, in order to calculate, OK, how much is this actually going to cost to, to actually put these things on the ground? And so what you can see is that top right chart is probably one of the, um, one of the scariest um, in the way that we think that with the increased uptake of heat pumps and EVs and the associated peak demands on, um, on distribution networks that arise from this, assuming some but not a lot of flexibility, as we said, so some flexibility but not the really ambitious stuff, we see that the majority of um, the new stuff that we've got to build needs to be built by 2035. And so, because you're breaching your headroom capacity of these networks. Now, that being said, we've had we had quite a lot of discussion in this project um, with various stakeholders, and it, it became clear that no one really has a great understanding about how much headroom capacity there is on any particular cable, any, any particular place. We've got a good understanding for substations, but not the cables. So we. Um, I think it's fair to say that we take a, a fairly conservative approach in how much capacity, uh, headroom capacity there is, like um, 10 to 20% headroom, whereas others might um, be more um, bullshy and maybe go towards 50%. Um, we, uh, we spend a lot of time talking to various people to understand if we are making reasonable assumptions here, and, um, uh, and, and we're, we're fairly confident that these are, if, if, if through lack of data, you'd rather look at the conservative stuff as opposed to kind of wishful thinking that we have 50% capacity headroom. Now, if you didn't translate that into, into costs, the, these aren't, um, the costs uh, in general are, are relatively high. Um, now, in the next, we're actually not too far out of line with the ED2 um, business plan costs. They're out to 2050, these costs are, are significant. Um, they are um, uh, uh, kind of, in the order of you can measure it against GDP, basically. Um, and just to give you an idea of the types of data, kind of types, types of challenges we're facing. So we are seeing the total transmission cable length growing by roughly 10% by 25, uh, by 2035 and 30% 30, 30 by 2050. Um, and this, this increased length of network is also kind of looking to carry a greater capacity. Um, uh, and then in terms of distribution length, uh, overall distribution length of network, uh, we, we see a need to increase by around about 25% 20, by 2035. Um, and demand side flexibility uh, can substantially mitigate this increase. Um, when we, we do have managed charging of electric vehicles and heat storage within this, um, but what we don't have is a representation of things like advanced network management and some of the, um, uh, some of the kind of the, the more kind of the less proven technologies, let's say, even even the stuff that we've got, isn't currently done. So, um, mass scale managed charging of electric vehicles isn't currently currently done. I think it's it's reasonable to say that it's achievable, given current technologies, but it's not currently done. Um, so um, so we've this is a it's, it's a fairly um fairly morbid picture, I suppose, when when you look at it in, the, in these lights, and it's it's quite. It's quite a heroic challenge that we we kind of are likely to face. So I think the the combination of um, actually um, uh, sex ramping up our ability to de deliver alongside investing in ways to try and minimise the amount we've got to deliver is is probably a good uh, a good combination to have. So just to give you a summary of some of the kind of engagement we had with the Beaver members, so we spoke to uh, 
a fairly broad range. So everything from multinational conglomerates who are who are kind of looking at the UK market alongside other international markets to kind of UK-based SMEs who are desperate to try and kind of um, kind of get their uh, get their technologies um, as part of this future energy system quite quite rightly. And so if you to kind of look at these organisations, 85% of them said that they expected to have to scale up by between 20 and 100% in order to meet the challenges of the of carbon logistics and the, and the energy system transition. Um, However, um, it was clear that there's an urgent challenge to move from market certainty to investment to run rate as quickly as possible. So when we spoke to um, a lot of the, a lot of these guys, they're saying, "Look, right, we are we are ready to kind of we are ready to go, but we need market certainty, um, some kind of market certainty before we can um, get the investment required into building new factories and, and things like that." And the actual lag between when you get investment to run rate. Can be can be about five years, and so when you think of that in terms of where we're at now in 2022, five years time, 27, before we can actually get the run rate run, run rate required in order to meet, go, get towards 2035. Um, and in addition, there's a strong belief that the kind of, as as you indicated before, the wider workforce is not quite ready to take advantage of the challenge. So, um, what, but what I, what I would say is that so this is kind of a summary slide. Um, uh, of what we kind of we talked about. So I've talked a lot about the left um, already, um, uh, but also uh, in the middle, we're talking about before kind of uh, what, what these stakeholders need in order to um, uh, in order to uh, kind of start to invest. It. And then on the right hand side, um, there's a number of recommend recommendations that we made within the report um, that uh, that might kind of help to kind of uh, unblock this kind of this um, this this chicken and egg situation we're in at the moment. Um, but if I just could skip over to the key messages that came out of this, so I think it's fair to say that when we start to dig into, you know, so I, I, I think this is the only kind of piece of modelling out there that has been able to translate from all energy system kind of optimised designs into kind of actual kind of fairly detailed parts of infrastructure and what needs to be deployed. And when you when you look into that, as we find quite often, the more you look into something, the more nuance you find and the more expensive it tends to get. And that, that's kind of that's what we found here is that the the costs of um meeting that zero are we we think that they're they're likely um what are other projections. Um, and the electricity supply chain um, they're, they're, they're ready. They kind of they expect to scale up in response to decarbonisation, but but currently um, the risks um, hinder that investment. Um, there is so some of the some of the feedback we had was that government kind of strategies and white papers um, they're good, um, but there's been a few burnt bridges where there's been a few U-turns in the past where kind of investments have been made and kind of um, um, and then things have U-turned, and so. I think part part of the issue that kind of if we read between the lines is that yeah there's, there's all great kind of talking rhetoric but now we need to actually kind of put kind of solid things in and so I think I do think the, the feedback was that some of these latest kind of reports and this was done before the latest energy security strategy um, but uh, uh, the, these reports are are useful for providing that certainty but it, it's I think it's fair to say that some stakeholders stakeholders need a bit more confidence than maybe they would have done pr pr previously. Um, and the UK net zero uh, strategy and UK um, heat and building strategy have gone some way, as I said, to providing the, that confidence. Um, skill shortage is, is a concern. The concern is that when okay, we're going to build this stuff, but it's not going to it's not going to leave. Um, it's not going to be able to um, be installed in time. Um, and so I think we need to address that in parallel and quite quite quickly. Um, and, and I think uh, I'll come to this in, in a second, but. Generally, it's positive. It's like the feeling was positive. The feeling that it was a huge challenge, but it's also for the stakeholders that we talked to. Quite clearly, it's a massive opportunity, um, it, and it also it's a really good opportunity for um, uh, kind of UK economic growth and jobs and leveling up. There's loads of opportunities based around this. We just need to be able to figure out um, exactly uh, how to kind of how to implement it really. Um, and so. Just these are kind of these weren't from the report itself, but a, a bit of reflection. I 
that I wanted to kind of um, convey. And is that, um, as I said, these these were um, kind of members of broadly focused on opportunities, but uh, and also but but also just say this is one scenario. And so I'm always a little bit conscious of presenting a single scenario um, within reports and. And even two scenarios, like I talked about, uh, talk about at the beginning, that's probably not enough to really understand all the kind of risks and uncertainties. And so there are various innovations that could have really high impacts. And um, an example that one might be um, uh, if, if you if you kind of created an even higher um, capacity cable, um, something like that is that it might actually have quite a big impact on costs because at the moment we're breaching the highest capacity that currently exists for cables when we look at these peak demands. And so if you're able to kind of develop a new one, then you wouldn't have to kind of run parallel lengths of cable. Things like that are actually quite high impact. Um, and uh, but the timescales are challenging. We can't, we can't get around that. And we have to we have to put in place policies and regulation mechanisms that support anticipatory, anticipatory long-term investment. Because if we've got this challenge, what we don't want to do is keep on investing every few years and kind of reinforcing, reinforcing, reinforcing. We need to be able to have some sort of long-term anticipatory investment to um to kind of make our deployment this most most efficient. And and I think this Beamer project has has got really good um kind of traction, uh, speaking to various various kind of people throughout government. And I think it it's it's one of the things that's going to hopefully contribute towards some of those policies um being being delivered. Um, so uh, okay, that so that's the. Um, that's the summary of the, some of the work that we've been doing recently. Um, really pleased to take any questions that any of you might have, um, uh, and also you feel free to drop me um, drop me an email if there's anything else that you'd like to discuss um, on the back of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. That was really interesting. I've I've been scribbling down questions as you went through, as I'm sure other people have, um, but uh, I think. Um, shall we have a bit of a system where if people have questions they want to ask, they stick their hands up? Uh, Scott's already uh, jumped the gun and he's got his hand up. So go first, uh, Scott, as you're, uh, as you're the chair. My the ex chair. Okay. Yes. Chris the chair now if, if he wants to deploy that prerogative of the first question. I, I, I think it's interesting that I've got a question that's selfish, so I'll come up with that one. But my observation is there must be great opportunities here for new businesses with innovations to come in and disrupt um, the, these patterns. I don't think you've got numbers right, because my idea is that the self-driving autonomous cars means that we don't need so many charge points, because you yeah. can program your car, you, you say, right, I'm going to bed at 11, I need it by 7, you go off and drive to the charge point at whatever time is needed. And I think if somebody can actually do that, if they can integrate the autonomous driving, that could quite easily wipe out all those charge points that's needed. But I'm sure yeah. you've got more people telling you where you've got your numbers wrong than where <laughs> you've got them right. So my, my selfish one, uh, electricity generation will increase and we have a market for hydrogen. So logically, we'd assume that if the, the amount uh, generation capacity increased, that these current high prices that we see now would ultimately come down on the assumption that it's nuclear and renewables. Where do you, where do you think the electricity price will end up? Because presumably, if it's cheap enough, people will produce hydrogen for, from it. And if it stays too high, they won't produce hydrogen from it. So what's the expected path for the cost of electricity compared to natural gas, for instance? Uh, <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite a tricky one to answer at the moment, isn't it? Um, so we've been doing some um, some sensitivity studies uh, recently around the kind of um, uh, the impact of increased electricity and gas costs. Um, and and it's, it can be um, it can be quite it can be quite profound, but there is a move there is well, I mean, it's actually a move towards um, uh, uh, move towards uh, electrolysis for hydrogen production. I think in a, in our least cost scenarios, we have um, kind of methane methane uh, steam methane reformation being used, but generally it kind of moves towards electrolysis when we start imposing some of these kind of sensitivities on it. I think in terms of the costs of electricity, um, 
I don't have the numbers to hand. We don't, so just to be clear, we, we talk about commodity costs here and kind of costs of the commodity to be delivered to a consumer. And we don't kind of factor in more the kind of market mechanisms and stuff like that. Um, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to give you wrong figures, figures on what that is, but um, generally the cost of the system goes up. And so the cost of electricity is likely to go up. It's just how, whether it goes up relative to kind of alternative um, uh, energy sources to provide and, and kind of services to end users. And I think in general, electricity is, well, by nature of it being um, uh, kind, of, kind of widely electrified, even in a kind of central scenario, um, electricity costs tend to be quite uh, kind of relatively low, albeit I think it's when we do test um, scenarios where we start to deploy quite high levels of electrification, then you see the costs really start to escalate. There's kind of trigger points um, where kind of you, you kind of trigger over, right, now we need to build X amount more nuclear, now we need to build X amount more peak, and now we need to build X amount more storage in order to cope with these Kind of um, the, the managing of the kind of electricity system in kind of uh, kind of relatively large swings with some of the technologies that we have, um, so I, I I hope like I don't think I can answer your question uh, your second question sufficiently to be honest with you um, without kind of digging into the data. I don't want to give you anything too wrong. Um, well, what I would say though is on the autonomous vehicle side, we we've looked into that, um, and generally we agree it, it is it, like we've looked into different modal shifts of transport, including autonomous vehicles. And it, it can have it can have significant effects on um, uh, uh, on your peak demands um, and therefore your cost of the energy system and the number of charge points you need. Um, however, um, I think I think yeah, you know, depending on who you talk to, I'm not I, I'm not I'm not sure what you do, what you do, Scott. But if, if it's in autonomous vehicles, I, I I'm just not sure when we're going to get them. Yeah, I, I I represent a well Sangaban overall, so we've we've got okay. lots of gas consumption and electricity, and it's really trying to. There's some voices that think the electricity price will come down as demand increases, but I think with electrolysis for the hydrogen, it'll never really decrease because if there's enough electricity around, people will find another reason for it. But yeah. as a as an energy vector to be able to overproduce electricity and store it as hydrogen and have an average hydrogen rate because we're not seasonal, we're, we're um, relatively constant all through the year. Mm. It's that great big challenge of should we electrify or should we replace methane with hydrogen? Yeah, so so we're doing some work at the moment with Wales and West Utilities. Um, where they're, they're looking at similar kind of similar questions about kind of what are the implications on their gas networks and we're using kind of the similar toolkits that we use in this project for the wells and west and um and i think it's fair to say that you know, kind of it's the actual role of hydrogen is really important and certainly the the fact that hydrogen doesn't have to be um kind of real real you know, kind of balanced in real time is kind of a really valuable aspect to that kind of energy vector um, and one thing that we as a Kind of as as a modeling team are quite um interesting is is the role of hybrid systems and um and the fact that you you should be able to uh, the value of hydrogen is in in some cases its ability to be able to store it to kind of relatively cheaply um and but can if you can use that to kind of uh, mitigate peaks on the electricity system then, and those peaks are could drive those extremely high system costs then you end up having a kind of a least cost system but then but then you have various challenges around what are your um, uh, uh, kind of what, what are your consumer propositions that you're actually going to kind of kind of talk to people about? Are you going to say, look, we know we you no longer own your boiler. We own your boiler. We'll run it for you, but we'll deliver you kind of outputs to your home. We're going to make sure that you're warm, and therefore you don't have to worry about which energy vector is producing your heat at any point at one point in time. Um, don't worry, the box is going to look really nice, and all, all these kind of things have to be done in order to actually start to switch people onto it now this is i mean i could go on about this later but this is one of the arguments for hydrogen is that it's kind of you're just replacing a gas with a gas and people are used to a gas and so um but i think the challenge with that is comes if you were to kind of do one if, if you were to go down that kind of a really extreme hydrogen route of like say 100 percent hydrogen within heating the the knock-on impacts of how to actually get that hydrogen are pretty are pretty significant in terms of the the amount of 
um, the actual knock on impact on the electricity sector is uh, significant in terms of how you produce the kind of uh, hydrogen through electrolysis. Um, and so there might be there might be innovative innovative kind of business models to do that, but generally we don't see that as a um, uh, as like a central case. I look forward to your presentation in ten years time <laughs> yeah. when we look back on how it actually happened. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think John John was next. Hi, John. Hi. Thanks, Alex. Um, um, uh, that was really interesting. Obviously, I've sort of heard it before, um, mm -hmm. which is why I asked you if you could um, give it for the uh, the branch here. Um, just uh, not really a question, but just an observation, really. Uh, it's sort of looking back on all the work, I saw that my abiding impression is, was really frustrating, to be honest, um, is that basically people, government, etc., are unwilling to admit just how much net zero is going to cost. And what mm. it means is you, you can't have proper conversations about trying to find the cheapest, most economical way of doing it if you don't actually admit what it's going to cost, I find. Mm. You, you, those sobering conversations where you've got to make some big choices sort of thing and also yeah. you, can't, you can't also drive the innovation which i think is coming out of this which actually the models tells you what the future looks like given what we know now but the whole point of doing that work is to sort of say well how could we change the world but, you know what could we do differently that makes it cheaper yeah yeah i think um and, if I to kind of respond on those, I think um, yeah, I think we had some first-hand experience of the former on this, where um, uh, I, I don't, I'm not going to go into too much because it's probably a bit, a bit com confidential, but there are um, those in government that kind of suggest it's going to be cheaper than we think. Um, but then when you kind of look into the way that kind of their, their modelling is done, there's some quite optimistic, um, uh, optimistic assumptions around, say, headroom or around the ability for technology to actually kind of stuff that doesn't isn't invented yet to kind of mitigate peaks in the next kind of five years and so and so th that kind of optimism within kind of techno a techno optimism within um kind of policy making is kind of potentially uh, a little bit counter um counter counterproductive to kind of as you say kind of recognizing the real costs and driving innovation through kind of through, through necessity, um, but um, what what I would say is that I mean e either way you look at it, whether it's kind of other people's costs or our costs, it's still a lot of money. I, I do feel like there is um, quite a lot of innovation that is being driven by the need. Probably what isn't catching up yet is the market transition to allow those innovations to actually kind of get the revenue that reflects the value that they play to, to the system. Um, and so I think there, there's a little bit of catching up to do on the markets. And so I mean, some of the stuff we do in the, within the cash is all about, about electricity market reform to to allow for more spatially temporal, more spatially granular, more temporally granular kind of physics reflective uh, energy pricing, to which will end up driving kind of things like the ability to kind of um, create business models to control decentralized behind the meter assets. Um, for them, for the required for meeting peak or, or energy as a service models, um, those kind of things require uh, electricity market reform, um, which uh, which will underpin us being able to do some of the stuff that we think needs to be done. I, I, I can just add, just add to, um, um, just to make it even harder. <laughs> um, we're also there's a material brain oriented electrical steel, which is a key component to transformers. Mm. Um, and that is already in short supply for various reasons. But amongst other things, it's being pulled in by the motor industry because it's a key component. Or sorry, the non-grain orientated is a key component. And a lot of the steel mills are switching their goes capacity across to non-orientated non for the electro. So, so we, there's just going to be so many supply constraints and so on when you start. And everything we're talking about in those graphs Every other country in you know the Western world will be doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, you're right. The more you look into each aspect of this, because I imagine that that's that's a great example. But I imagine that in kind of, there's probably dozens of sectors that kind of we identify across the supply chain that will probably be facing similar problems. And there's probably a weak there's probably a weak point in their supply chain that isn't able to 
scale up for whatever reason, which in itself would drive the need for innovation to find alternative things. And so I think there's a whole wealth of things of kind of further further investigation you can do here to identify innovation opportunities on the back of understanding what the kind of how much how much stuff do we need. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, uh, I'm not sure who's next. Is Mike? Thanks, Mike. Hi, hi, hi there. Um, Bye -bye. Yeah, good, good presentation. I, I've got a number of questions actually. So I'll, I'll start with um, on the costing side. Hmm. Uh, how accurate do you think the costing is on the models? Um, because a number of years ago, we actually had an ETI presentation, which, which I think is a precursor to this. And the output of that basically said that heat pumps would dominate the heat market. Um, and it didn't have much space for, for hydrogen. Um, and I know there are some people think hydrogen is a lot of hype and probably isn't going to be as economic as people suggest, because you start with electricity if you're going to electrolyze. Why not use the electricity directly rather than convert it to hydrogen, um, transport the hydrogen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so on the cost side, I think the heat pumps versus the hydrogen is an interesting one. I think nuclear, do, do you have any, you, there's a lot of nuclear in there, I'm assuming, because your fossil fuels are going down. How, how accurate is that? Because you know, we're building Hinkley Point, that's based on the reactor at Flamanville. I can't remember when, even I can't remember when Flamanville should have been commercial but i've got a feeling it was 2009 something like that and it still isn't commercial it won't be operating at full well, it may never operate at full power um and we're building hinkley point based on that I, i'm assuming that you're assuming that hinkley point will come in on budget which will be the first nuclear power station possibly to ever do that and it'll be in on time again mm. it'll be one of the first I, i'm not I, I saw some data recently every single nuclear power station was behind budget, behind time. Um, so I, on, on that side, can, can you just comment on uh, the, the sort of the error bars on the costing, if you like, and if we don't meet targets, how different is the, how much more expensive is, is this net zero um, agenda? Okay, um, so uh, error bars and costs. Um, so let me address a couple of things first. Um, so when you um, when you had had that presentation from the ECI, so I was at the ECI before ESC, um, and uh, and so back at the ETI, I think we was only at the very dying days of the ETI in kind of 2017 when um, when we started introducing hydrogen to space heating, and so um, and we was, we had some quite interesting findings there, including the Kind of the real necessity for salt cavern storage to be um, uh, to be kind of a dispatchable uh, on a kind of a within, within day basis in order to drive the need for a kind of a hydrogen within homes. Um, so there are various reasons why hydrogen kind of we see hydrogen as being having a, a role to play within homes within certain scenarios. Um, but in terms of the um, cost error bars, is it, I mean it's a it's a, it's a Difficult question to ask the answer, but there's a couple of things I'll say. One is that all of our costs are nth of a kind costs, and so uh, and so one might say that for nuclear, that's quite a hard justification to make because there are so few um, nuclear power plants out there that it's hard to reach that nth of a kind cost. And so that's uh, and I think what we're seeing with um, some of these nuclear power stations uh, is that that nth of a kind cost isn't really representative uh, yet. What we would say is that most of the nuclear um, uh, reactors that we uh, we end up deploying within these models um, tend to be kind of the advanced modular reactors, small modular reactors, which have a higher potential for reaching that nth of a kind cost um, uh, kind of more more effectively. And so we did a quite a in depth piece of work recently on kind of nuclear cost drivers. Um, and uh, and if, if you're interested in understanding kind of how we see the costs of nuclear potentially falling and, and what mechanisms through which they can do that, that's the kind of that piece of work to read on. And so I'd say that we are probably um, a little bit optimistic on some costs, um, uh, but in terms of the uh, and in terms of the error bar, uh, I'd say that in terms of say things like infrastructure as well, we have 
we're, we're fairly uh, we're fairly confident in the majority of the infrastructure. There are there are some pieces of infrastructure that are uh, more difficult, such as kind of what are all the costs associated with with repurposing to to to, to a hydrogen network. Um, but we've done dedicated pieces of work on that in the past as well, building on some of the work that Bayes have done with Element Energy um, uh, to try and understand those costs in a bit more detail. So um, I, would, I would never want to say that our costs are, are, are kind of accurate, they're not, but I think um, they're probably amongst the kind of the best you can you, you can get in anything like this. But I think the error bars in any kind of model like this are going to be pretty sizable. Like, uh, I don't know, uh, if I was to kind of just finger in the air, I guess, I'd, I'd guess that I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised in seeing a 20%, 30% kind of um, shift, in, shift in costs for any for any energy system model, depending on what assumptions you make um, around, around the model. I think it's, um, and that's why kind of what I was saying towards the end is you've got to be careful about how we interpret a single scenario. And I think having, having a whole variety of scenarios is always, is always useful. What I would say is that we, within the CB6 um, scenario that we have used for this one, we have in the background, um, not as part of the beam of project, in the background as part of our own work, done kind of our Monte Carlo analysis on that to understand what the uncertainty around costs and performances have um, on system design within within ESME. And it's not um, it, it, like it it doesn't the, the actual story doesn't change. It's it's a, it's a similar story with some things growing, some things kind of reducing, depending on what kind of uh, what variables being changed. But the actual trend is quite um, is quite similar because because what you do find within these scenarios and what we found between the ETI and the ESC as we went into net zero, we found that our ability to have different systems was starting to narrow down as as it was becoming more and more constrained. There were less there there were fewer and fewer options for actually meeting net zero and all the of, of a net zero system with different energy system design. So it's kind of almost a little bit. Um, and, and, and I think there are probably radical other other radical energy system designs that are likely to be kind of competitive. Um, but the by nature of optimizations, sometimes you have an optimizer optimization that's another completely different system that sits here that's um, uh, more expensive that doesn't get chosen. So um, yeah, I, there, there's a lot to say on that. I can I can point in the direction of some of them here we've got on costs if uh, if, if you want to see it. Yeah, I, I, I'm just, I'm a bit concerned, well, I'm very concerned, actually, because models like this inform policymakers, and uh, not all of them are sufficiently intelligent. They'll just see the headline, so they'll see that the nuclear looks like a good answer. But if the nuclear power is out double the budget and twice as long to build it, you know, if Hinkley Point isn't online until 2040, 2050 isn't very far away. So to decarbonize with with nuclear, when all the other nuclears are waiting for Hinkley Point to be proven, mm. um, it, it is, is a concern when government seems to be backing nuclear and small modular reactors are, are completely unproven. Um, the business models are unproven and they need to build thousands of them to reach the cost point that they're proposing. That's an extremely high risk model. If they don't reach that cost point, their prices are more than double. So I see two, two of the key cornerstones quite concerning. And I think hydrogen, I know a lot of people in the commercial world believe hydrogen is more hype than substance, and they can see a number of scenarios where it won't work. Um, hydrogen only becomes cost effective if it's used in transport and heating and as back, um, backup for power generation. Mm -hmm. So if it's not using all of those three, the price actually potentially increases. And again, government is supporting hydrogen, but it's uh, supporting it, I believe, excessively. There are other solutions which are lower risk, which yeah. potentially can deliver the same functionality and could deliver the, the decarbonization. So, so, so that, that's, that's my feedback on you. Yeah, I think, so I, think, I, I mean, I, I tend, I would say I fully agree, but I do recognise the um, uh, recognise the concern. I think um, you do, like as an organisation that produces um, modelling outputs, whether it be us, CCC, or or Feds, we've got to be careful about kind of what what we're saying. And so, before we kind of publish 
anything like this one although it was a single scenario that we're publishing this one was backed up this is our central kind of scenarios that we are pretty kind of confident in um in the kind of robustness of it um and i think uh, you you you're absolutely right on kind of being nervous about nuclear and we're, we're doing a lot of a lot of work on nuclear at the moment um uh kind of some of it driven by the energy security strategy and some of it kind of historically we've been we've done quite a lot of work on nuclear um to understand kind of why there is this cost discrepancy between predicted and actual costs and how we can actually address that and i think it does require some of these recommendations to be acted upon in order to actually meet those cost drivers and so we mean for example we do a lot of work with rolls royce and on their kind of small modular reactor program and i think um uh i I know this is this is just not, not a cast box for you, but my view, I I, I believe that um, uh, small modular reactors are actually quite um, uh, they're quite an exciting um, technology that has the potential to not only kind of produce kind of um, uh, kind of the electricity that we we need, but also there's various pieces of work that we're doing and other people are doing around the production of low cost hydrogen um, uh, and and the kind of and low cost heat to go to heat networks. So. Uh, I think, it, uh, but what I would say is that we're not at the point where we're picking winners yet. I still think that um, we should be an out, uh, the government should be an outcome based kind of innovation, uh, kind of, um, uh, kind of, they should be promoting out, output, based, output based innovation. So not picking technologies, which I think some people are skeptical that they are doing at the moment in terms of down the kind of nuclear kind of hole or down the hydrogen hole. Um, and, and I, I do think that we should be focusing on outputs as opposed to kind of the technologies. So I think I agree with you on that sense. And there, just let other technologies, other innovations, um, have their fair place at the table. Should they be competitive with with them um, with the ones that we're seeing at the moment? Yeah. So you're on mute, Mike. Okay. Um, my question is really about this social and political acceptability of some elements of the transition, because. Yeah. Um, I think I completely agree with what John was saying earlier that many people in government don't seem to have really grasped the cost of the net zero transition, but one who has is this chap Steve Baker and his net zero watch. And much as I can't abide the man, I think he's actually doing us a favour in the sense that he is trying to be trying to sort of highlight just the fact that doing what we say we're committed to doing is going to be very, very expensive and people need to understand that. So I think once that does become understood, and I'm sure he's such a communicator, as I say, I've, I've got no, no um, brief for Steve Baker whatsoever, but I think he was largely responsible for the mess that is Brexit, and I'm sure he's going to succeed in explaining to people the cost associated with net zero. So there's a political element there that won't be popular, but there's also a technical acceptability thing that if, if we're expecting some people to take on board heat pumps and some in their homes, others to perhaps make the switch to a district heating system that they've got no experience of at all, other people to think about hybrid heat pumps and maybe devices. I can see what you're saying about the acceptability of hydrogen. People sometimes seem to have a very low tolerance for dramatic changes, particularly when the, the nation is, uh, is facing a cost of living crisis. So do you have any way of modeling within the ESC? So the technical and political acceptability of some of the options that, that, that seem very good from, from an engineering point of view? Um, so I think when we start getting, from, from a national level, I think it's hard to do. One thing that we have started to do through this kind of process that we've kind of talked about here, is start to look at some of the underlying challenges that we might face, because ultimately, if we have, um, if we go down this route of, kind of at the moment, they've got a consultation on heat network zoning, where they're essentially saying, uh, kind of trying to identify heat network zones. If you do similar things for uh, electrification zones or, or kind of hydrogen zones, like hypothetically, then you end, you're going to end up with, um, unless you have a cross-vector regulated system, you're going to end up with um, people um, paying for um, kind of a service disproportionately more than someone else in, in a neighboring area, just purely based on their postcode. And so I think there is going to be challenges associated um, with that and the regulation around how you recover costs for infrastructure development um, and kind of kind of commodity supply for particular services, um, and so uh, we can highlight some of the problems in terms of actually kind of working with um, kind of consumers to actually um, to understand how to actually overcome some of these. I think the more the more 
you know, there's, there's part of the, the organization that we do more on that. Well, one, we have a big consumer insights team that helps to try and understand what people actually would like and what kind of whether, for example, the energy as a service idea is something that we've been kind of pushing a lot, not just because um, uh, it's um, uh, kind of a, a, an easy way to control people's appliances, which is kind of the skeptical to think, to a way to think about it, but also um, it's, it's a way to ensure that you're driving kind of commercial organizations to deliver services to people and so that those services are driving kind of the um uh kind of the the kind of the technologies that are being deployed as opposed to having to force individual consumers to make a decision about whether to go for a hybrid or a heat pump and trying to take that kind of um uh, uh reliance uh, away from um individuals and go to more of a service-based kind of um, industry i i think local energy planning is one way you can start to do this so the more the more you can engage with the people on the ground who are actually going to be affected um, by this the more likely you are to get success so i think i'll be completely ineffective if i just went to an area and said you're on heat networks go i think you'd have kind of severe backlash but i think through through engagement and through understanding what kind of people prioritize what people kind of really value within their heating systems and um and the kind of going beyond what they kind of say in a survey and more kind of if you give them the experiences to understand kind of wh whether this is actually what they want um, and uh, the more kind of you can do that kind of work the more likely you are to get traction with some energy system science um so yeah i think i think it is incredibly hard i think there is going to be a lot of um kind of social political kind of work that needs to be done um and it's it, if i'm being honest it, it puts me a little bit out of my comfort zone as a as a very technical person <laughs> Well, it's what the government have done with cars, isn't it? They've made the decision. They've given enough notice. They brought the timescales down. It's one of the few times they've actually made a positive step. They didn't. They didn't ask people if they wanted to do it. It's just, it will happen. Get used to it. Yeah, I think. Um, I think you're right. And the, the thing that I wrestle with is, is that um, kind of within, with with the car space, kind of. I know there's not many people that think that. Um, EVs aren't the way to go. Um, there, are, there are some kind of hydrogen vehicle advocates, but generally kind of it's EVs. Because with the um, heating system, it's there are so there's so many different choices. And and at the moment, if you can put a you can put a ban on gas boilers, but how do you make sure that people make the right decision? Because you, um, you take the decision away, you you make it on new builds. Yeah. And, and people don't have the decision. It's, it's from a limited list. And ultimately, it will trickle through, but they're not even starting making that decision, are they? So, yeah. Mike, you've got your hand up. I, I was just going to say, well, I was pick, pick up on that. Um, there are people who don't think uh, EVs are the way to go, and one of them is Toyota, which is the mm. biggest, was the biggest car company in the world until Tesla shares went bonkers. Um, but no, I, that, that, I can... wasn't, that wasn't what the question I was going to ask, actually. The question I was going to ask, you, you, you're suggesting in the models that there's going to be a big increase in heat pumps. Do you consider the release of refrigerant from the heat pump uh, in your carbon modelling, or is it just the power consumed by the heat pump? So, yes, yeah, good question. We, we, we don't. Uh, uh, we don't consider it the refrigerant. We are uh, actively looking to improve the way that we represent kind of embodied emissions and kind of them. Um, uh, and kind of other emissions that kind of from from the energy sector, and I think that's one of the areas where we probably um, we will need to we need to act on. We we we've done some work on upstream kind of gas emissions and embodied emissions of kind of particular technologies that we kind of don't manufacture in the UK and things like that, alongside all the assumptions around that the CCC um, kind of take around non-energy system related emissions that we kind of. Uh, carry forward into our modeling but we don't we don't look at those refrigeration commission uh, refrig refrigerant um effects okay i mean just looking at refrigerants as a, an emission i think 1.5 gigatons of global emissions is from refrigerants mm. so if we increase the number of heat pumps although the gwp of the refrigerant is going down r32 is still nearly 700 mm. so it's not insignificant and at the end of the life it is quite an impact still. It, that's when it's all released. It was released in manufacturing and end of life, but it's not manufactured over here. 
we're almost excused. You don't count that. Yeah. The end is, of life it, yeah. Is, it is released, but so that's, yeah, that's part of the reason this this embodied emissions thing is going to be quite uh, interesting from that perspective. But yeah, that, that's a that's a good point. Thank you. It's included in FGAS uh, regulations and so on, and the government does have a budget for it, I think, which they're working on to reduce. Yeah, but FGAS doesn't go down. It's, it's not phased out. You'll have quite an inventory by 2032. It's, it's on a downward trend, according yeah. to the regulations. Not phased out, but downward. And there is actually a calculation government are doing between the uh, um, the sort of net zero element of heat pumps and their uh, environmental costs. So. Ricky, Rick, you put your hand up as well. Uh, you are me, Rick. So it was partly a, um, a question and partly um, uh, a question to you about whether you want to carry on uh, uh, spending time with us, Alex, because I, I guess you've got <laughs> you might have had other plans for your evening. And I'm conscious that we're, we're, we're taking more of your time than we said we would. I'm happy for another question. Oh, OK, good. man. Yeah. Well, well, this this one was about the, the trilemma, really. It just seems to me that this is the year that all three parts of the trilemma became a lot more serious if, if anybody thought they could have got more serious. So, you know, we've got the cost of living crisis, obviously, has mm -hmm. made the cost part of the, of the trial. And we've got the IPCC report, which has really sort of boosted our concern about the emissions part of it. And now we've got this horrendous war in Ukraine, which has really focused everybody on the energy security part. Have any of these things made your job easier or harder? Um, I think... Uh, so... Uh, I... I I think some, sometimes when you have, as, as I kind of mentioned with the net zero thing, sometimes when you have a particularly stressful situation, it ends up making some recommendations a little easier um, because you are narrow, narrowing your kind of solution space to, to kind of, um, but, but in general, when you have big kind of um, big changes in your kind of your input assumptions, uh, such as the kind of projections for kind of gas prices and things like that, then it tends to turn everything that you've done in the past kind of into a bit of kind of a big one big caveat. Um, and so um, and so you tend to kind of all the stuff that you've kind of understood before, just like we some kind of someone mentioned the ETI's heat pump kind of projections before, we don't we can't really refer to that anymore. We we've done loads of good work on that in the past, but we can't really refer to it too much anymore because net zero changes changes the world or changes uh, the UK uh, and the world, hopefully. Um, so, um, so I think uh, if and then on the kind of the IPC uh, on the kind of the IPCC stuff, it would help if this if it landed with with people and if you if we went from a from we are two scenarios from a clockwork world to a patchwork world where you had a lot of kind of more a lot more engagement. Um, in kind of various innovations, I think um, that that would help. Now, I just I just don't know from I've been you know, how long have I, been? I haven't been kind of in this energy systems running space for too long, like uh, kind of eight ten years, and I, I've already felt like I've grown very skeptical of um, of of how much we we can rely on people to to engage on on mass in in them. Um, in some of this stuff, and and I, I think that it's a a lot of the stuff that we've got to do we almost has to just recognise that people want progressively better things, and the thing that we've got to deliver next is a thing that's the thing that they want but better, and at the same time is is low carbon. So, uh, so I think the IPCC thing, it it is not helping from the point of view of um uh, of of people's engagement, but I don't think it's making our job any harder, um as such. Um, uh, yeah, I hope, that's, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thanks. Yeah, I, I can see that it's a, a thing that gives you a lot of thought, and it, and it does. <laughs> yeah. well, well, fine. Uh, that's been absolutely fantastic, Alex. Thank you so much for for your time and your honesty with us tonight. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's been yeah, been a real pleasure. And it's not, it's not. Yeah, it, uh, it's really nice to have loads of really really good questions and really good challenge. So um. Sometimes, uh, yeah, I, I don't always get that, but thank you very much for your engagement and I really appreciate it.